So it is lesson eight today, sunny Tuesday after reading week. We're just launching into the second half of our course. Um, we, we've done a little review of the midterm exam. I did not include it in the recording. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the kind of thing I want included in the YouTube stream. Um, as I may reuse or repurpose some of the exam components in the future. Um, okay, so today, now that we've done that, let's have a look at assignment three. It's now posted to Blackboard. You can find it under assignments. We'll go over the requirements. So assignment three is an extension of assignment two you're going to be implementing security into assignment two. Counts for 10% of the final grade. You have two weeks to do it. So 13 days it's due on Monday the 15th at 5 p.m. Um, that's lots of time. This is not a huge assignment, so it shouldn't stress you out too much. So you can resubmit the exact same links for assignment three that you did for assignment two. So you can use the same Git repository. And if you still have Azure credits, then you can just redeploy, you know, deploy, use the same Azure link. I know a lot of students have been telling me that their Azure credits have been expiring. So, um, Manjinder, was it you who found smarterasp.net? I know somebody in the class has been using it, yes. So shout out to Manjinder who found smarterasp.net. So, SmarterASP.net will give you a free 60-day trial. And they, that will include access to an SQL Server database and allow you to publish your website here. So 60 days, it doesn't require a credit card, and obviously this will be long enough to last us through to the end of the semester. So you can use this as an alternative to Azure. There is no cost. Uh, one thing, yep. That's okay, because yeah, they're probably obviously putting it on a you know a shared server. They're not allocating a lot of a lot of resources, compute resources to it. But that's okay. They do not support continuous integration from GitHub, however. So you would be uploading your web application the traditional way with FTP, the same way you would have done in your PHP course. So you can use this as an alternative by signing up for the free trial. Um, I've asked them about some kind of like student plan. If they would give us a student plan, they haven't gotten back to me, but at least we know 60 days for free will get you through the end of the semester. So if you republish your site using smarterasp.net, that's fine. Just include the link to the live website instead of um, using Azure. So you're going to keep working on your assignment. I'm not asking you to go ahead and build something new. You're continuing to work on the assignment you submitted um, before reading week. So there's two parts. Ah, yes, you can also publish directly through Visual Studio. That's a good option as well, Manjinder. Yep, that'll work. You can use FTP or you can publish straight from Visual Studio. So we're going to be adding both local and social authentication. So we've covered local authentication in our class before reading week. So if you need help with any of that, you can always refer to the lesson six videos uh, on the YouTube channel and then the social authentication we're gonna be doing today. So what do, you, what do you need to do in your application? Like we did in our last lesson, in the startup.cs, you'll wanna disable the default option that's set to true where it requires an email confirmation. All right, good for you. Uh, then I want you to create an account for me so this way, when I have 35 assignments to mark, I don't have to go and register 35 times. So please register an account using rich at gc.ca and use our same password we've been using in class of test123 dollar sign with a capital T. That way I can just log in to everybody's site with this set of credentials. You're then going to make changes to your site. So all the views for adding, editing, and deleting, all the methods there are private. So only authenticated users can access them. You do not need different user roles. I'm not asking you to include authorization with different levels of roles and permission. Simply 
different permissions for authenticated users and anonymous users. On the index views, anonymous users can view your data, but they should not see the links to create, edit, and delete. So when I'm logged in, I can see the create, edit, delete links, and I can add, edit, and delete data. When I'm not logged in, I should only be able to view the data with no ability to add, edit, or delete. You're also going to enable Google sign-in. We're going to do that today in our global grub. So you're going to need to install a NuGet package. You're going to need to generate API keys in the Google Developer Console. We're going to do that today. You'll need to authorize your live website, whether it runs on Azure or on Smarter ASP. And then you'll need to add those keys to your app settings JSON file. So your web application can use your Google API keys. You will make sure you're committing regularly to GitHub. So I'd like to see a minimum of four commits made over at least two days. Um, and then publish your site to Azure or Smarter ASP and include the link. So you may have to update your README file. Maybe your site was deployed on Azure before, your credits are gone, you now need to move to Smarter ASP. So please include the link to the current live version of the site. This is not a huge assignment. I would imagine you're gonna to have to do some work in the Google Developer Console you probably don't need to write more than, I don't know, about 20 lines of code. You probably need to put about 20 lines in your project. So 13 days uh, is lots to get this assignment done. Okay, so eight marks for the authentication piece that only authenticated users can create, edit, delete. Four marks for successfully implementing fully functional Google sign-in. And again, that should work both locally as well as in order to get full marks, it also has to work on your live site. And then a couple of marks for version control and deployment to the server. Okay, so total out of 15. Um, are there any questions about the assignment? Yes, Alex, question? Sure, go ahead. You don't need to use roles at all in the assignment. If your application requires roles, you can do it. But then also please make sure you give me the admin login that I would need. You give me all of the logins I would need, but I'm not requiring you to have different types of users. Correct. So an anonymous user can only read the data. Anybody that registers and logs in can edit. Now I know some of you may have more sophisticated rules in your application where you want to have, for example, admin users who can do certain things, other types of users who can do other things. If that's the way you're setting up your assignment, that's totally fine. Then, yeah, that's fine if you've already done that, but just make sure you give me um, whatever logins I would need in addition to, if I need more than just the my, this login, then please make sure you include that in your submission. So I have it. Yeah, it's fine if you do have different user levels, but it's not required. So I will leave that up to you. Excellent question. Any, does anybody else have any questions? Need any clarification about any of the requirements?
Okay, thanks, Julia. All right, so you can find the assignment and the document on Blackboard now. Okay, now just before we get into our Google authentication, I want to spend just a few minutes, not a lot, maybe five, 10 minutes, having a little chat about SSL. So there's a link here on Blackboard in the week eight folder. So if you go here to padlet.com slash auth slash login, you can log in with your Georgian login. And then I want you to go to the second link, this little whiteboard. This over here. So what I want you to do is click on the plus sign and add a little note with your name Tell me what you know about SSL. Marcos has already put a comment here. Go ahead and tell me what else do you know about SSL? Really important for web developers to understand. I'll maybe pause the recording for a couple minutes, give you a little bit of time to contribute to the board. All right, so seeing lots of pretty key information about SSL. So SSL, yeah, it's a secure protocol used to encrypt traffic between a browser and a web server. So by default, HTTP, it sends all messages in plain text. So when you enter a username and password, for example, in a login screen and submit that form, and that data gets sent from your browser to the web server, that would go in plain text. Or you're entering a credit card number when you're gonna buy something. Um, or at the same time, the traffic that comes back from the web server, let's say you're logging into your banking website and it's gonna show your account numbers and balances. Normally, all of that text gets sent back and forth in plain text. So as Scott points out, SSL, it secures the connection. It encrypts all of that traffic so that anybody snooping or anybody intercepting that traffic would have to decrypt it in order to read the content. And as Attila mentioned, so the server has a signed key and the clients have their own keys. And Jackie mentions that we can see SSL we can actually see it in our browser, first of all, because the URL will start with S, and second, because the browser is going to indicate it's got this lock, some kind of lock or secure symbol, and it's actually going to tell us who has verified the certificate. It says we've got a secure connection. It's verified by Cloudflare. It tells us when the certificate is good until and it actually gives us information about the certificate issuer. It gives us the algorithm of how it's secured. So it's using SHA-256 and the fingerprinting. So it's a way of authenticating the validity of the website. So yeah, it's making sure that not only is our traffic secure, but as Nam mentioned, it's authentic. So as Julia says, We'll use it for things like credit card transactions, any data transfers, any site that has a login, which now is almost every website. Alha also mentions about authenticating the site's identity, that the website says, now it's again, it's for verification because the SSL certificates also come in different, they have different levels of encryption. And the more expensive ones have higher levels of encryption. So nowadays, it used to be that we would buy SSL certificates only if we had some sort of privacy, private area on our website. 
you know, we were dealing with credit cards or people were logging in. That's kind of changed now. Over the last few years, SSL has become so important that we need it for every website, even if that website is simply HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, even if there's nothing secure. And there's a couple of reasons why. Can you think of any reason why we would need SSL, even if we're just building like a static website with no sensitive data? Why would we still want an SSL certificate? Okay, yeah. It still protects us from attacks. Yes, it verifies, helps verify the identity. That's true. Those are good points, Scott. There's a couple of other reasons we would still want SSL, even for a site that was not containing sensitive data. Well, yeah, the browser is going to mark it as not secure, first of all. Yeah, it still it still protects from can still protect from hacking to a degree, but we want our site to be marked as secure in the browser. The other reason is that SSL, as of a few years ago, and I put this article up here describing SSL a bit more clearly. So you know your browser will mark it some it'll mark it as secure, for example. Um, but as of a few years ago, Google actually started factoring SSL into its search engine rankings. Exactly, Marcos. Thank you. <laughs> exactly what I was going to say. So a site without SSL will not rank as highly in search engine results as sites that have them. So even if your site doesn't have anything that you need to protect, you still need SSL. So how do you get an SSL certificate? There's a couple of ways. Let's look at it. Um, most web hosting companies will offer. So you could, there's two ways you can do it. You can either buy them directly through your hosting company. That's the easiest way because you just pay the web hosting company and they install and configure the certificate. So, for example, if you host somewhere like this, at GoDaddy, you can just buy an SSL certificate here. The challenge with them is they're quite expensive. They start at $85 a year here. Yes, Attila, we'll, uh, we'll come to that. You're right. So different levels of encryption here. $85 a year, is, it's quite expensive per year. Now, this isn't a cost to us as the developer. Typically, we purchase the certificates for our clients and then we bill them. We might even mark up the cost. Yes, you can, Atila, there are places you can buy cheap ones. I often buy them here. I don't want my clients to spend $85 for an SSL certificate. So I often buy them here from Namecheap, $7, $12 something like that, but you have to do more work. You have to work with the hosting company to configure these if you go the less expensive route. Place like GoDaddy, you just purchase it. They do all the work, but GoDaddy will only let you use their certificates. You can't buy a cheap one somewhere else if your website's hosted on GoDaddy. They won't support it. The other option that many hosting companies have moved to is Let's Encrypt is a not-for-profit certificate authority. So many hosts now support Let's Encrypt, and these are actually free. So one of the hosts that I use, I can just enable a Let's Encrypt SSL just with a click of a button in the hosting control panel. So this is a good option, but not all web hosts will support Let's Encrypt SSL. This is the, the cheapest. It doesn't get any cheaper than free. So this is a great option if the hosting company you're dealing with will support it. So why are we talking about this? How does this relate to the rest of what we're doing? Well, number one, I mean, SSL is an essential part of securing any web application, regardless of we're working in ASP.NET or PHP, Node.js, 
or something else. So we need to understand what SSL is. Then I also want to look at, so how does this, how does this get implemented in ASP.NET? I still got, uh, I've still got Yulia's site up and running. So when we created the project, we had a checkbox that we've enabled that said enable SSL. We checked that off when we ever we created our project. And that does a few things. In our startup file, it adds this line of code, this use HTTPS redirection. So what this means is anytime a user tries to request a page without HTTPS, it's going to redirect them back to the HTTPS, the secure version. So what does this look like? So here, for example, if I try to go to HTTP, let's encrypt.org, so I'm going to the un, try to load the unencrypted version of the page, it redirects me back to the HTTPS version. I do the same thing here on Padlet. So pretty much every site now that uses HTTPS, it's got this redirection. So there's a check. It says if any requests come in in plain HTTP unencrypted, we're going to redirect back to the secure version with HTTPS to make sure that traffic gets encrypted. So when we check that box, this line of code gets added to our project. The other thing that you'll notice If I look at the properties of my project, you'll notice there are actually two URLs. There's an app URL here. There's a plain HTTP version. But because we enabled SSL, when I run, if I run Yulia's project here again, notice it runs under HTTPS and the port number always starts with 443. So you can see the SSL port is here in our project. So 443 is the default SSL port. So every project we run in, from Visual Studio in IIS Express, if we enable SSL, the first three numbers will always be 443 something. If I go and open up now, for example, my Global Grub project, we'll see that the local URL will be HTTPS. And again, it's gonna run under 443 with some other two numbers at the end. So by enabling SSL when we set up the project, our, our site is already forcing SSL. And if we publish it to a web server, we just need to make sure that we have an SSL certificate running there as well. So I'm gonna go and open up my Global Grub project And when I launch it, we'll see it also runs on, an, on HTTPS at a port number that starts with 443. So here's 44321. Yulia's project was set at 44334. So that'll always be the default. And again, if I try to take out HTTPS here, Right? It doesn't. There is. It doesn't run on HTTP only on that port number. So we want to be sure we're always enabling that. Um, Alex, I think you can run it on other ports, but four four three is the default. Um, on a Windows server, it's the default for HTTPS. I don't think it has to run on 443, so you can override it if you choose to. But by default, when you enable HTTPS, it'll always start with this 443, followed by two other, two other numbers. So again, if I go and look, I'll see the same things here in my startup file. I'm going 
going to see that HTTPS redirection is enabled. And if I go and look at my project properties in the debug tab, we'll see that SSL is enabled. And again, my port number is going to start with 443 by default. Okay. So make sure you've got your global grub project open. I'm going to close everything up because we've got a whole lot of files open. So here was where we left off. So last week we made it, last lesson I should say, it's been three weeks. We created an admin account. When we logged in as an administrator, we had access to the categories and products. We also created a customer account. So I could log in as either an administrator or a customer, but now as a customer, I don't, didn't get access. I don't have access to the categories and products. I tried to go to either one. I don't get sent to the login screen because I'm already logged in. But I just told I don't have access to the categories or products resources. So this is kind of where we left off last week. So we used the built-in register page that Visual Studio gave us and then we also customized the code a little bit behind the register page so that we were automatically adding new users into the customer role. That was all the stuff we did back in lesson six. So we we're kind of dealing with what happens over here on the left side of the page when someone interacts with this user form. Today, we're going to deal with this part. So it says right now there are no external authentication services configured. So this page is already coded that if we enable Google sign in in the project, what will happen is this message is going to disappear and we're going to have a Google login button that will automatically get added to the form. So we can actually take a quick look at our, our register page it was under areas and identity and pages and accounts. So all the way down in here, if you just keep expanding those folders, here was our register view that we added into the form. We scaffolded it. So there's two parts to this. We didn't change any of the HTML on this page. We kind of looked at it briefly in our last lesson. So the first part is the form on the left side for the email, the password, the two password boxes and the register button. The right side is the for the third party services. And there's an if statement here. It says if there are external login. If there are no external logins, it prints out this message that we see. That says there are no external services configured. If there are external logins, then we've got a loop here. It loops through each one of the external login providers and generates a button with the name of that provider. So Microsoft was even kind enough to link to a tutorial on how to enable 
a third party authentication provider. So it explains right from setting up a new project. So we don't need to do this. So we're going to pretty much go through the example in the tutorial here. So it explains how to use the Google Developer Console and then integrate that into our project. So we're going to do this together and then you're going to have a lab where you are either on your own or with one or two other classmates, you're going to then integrate Facebook login as well. It's fairly similar, one or two small differences in about 90% the same though, in how we configure Google and Facebook. So we'll go over Google together. So the references are here, you can link to it, it's right here in your project. But I'll get, get, give you a bit of a preview, in my own words, of how we're gonna do this. And these slides are here on Blackboard for you to reference the lesson eight slides, but I'm just gonna kind of do a quick walkthrough, give you an overview of what it looks like, and then we will do it step-by-step step together. So we're gonna have to go to the Google developer console, not in there. We're going to create a project there and we're going to have to configure the consent screen. So we have to decide, are we allowing any Google user to log in or only within our organization? So we'll just say any Google user can log in. We have to configure the consent screen. So we'll have to put in the name of our application. So something like Global Grub. We'll have to put in our own Google email for our Google account. And then we need to set, create a set of credentials. So we're gonna create an OAuth client ID. And when we do that, again, we'll put in we're gonna choose web application and we'll need to put in redirect URIs. So the redirect URI, it tells Google, where does the user go after they log in? And for our store, we can just use our local host. For your assignment, you'll need both the local host for your assignment as well as the live website. And the URL will be the domain and then slash sign in dash Google. That's the URL ASP.NET is going to expect the users to be taken back to. And when we're all done, Google's gonna generate a set of API keys. One is called the client ID and the other is called the client secret. And in order for our web application to be able to talk to the Google project, we're going to need to add these API keys into the web project in Visual Studio. There's two ways of doing this. I've documented them both here. Um, in a real production site, we would use the Windows Key Vault locally, and then the Azure configuration section live. It's more secure and it's encrypted, but we are not gonna use this method in class just because many people no longer have access to Azure. So to keep things simple, we're just gonna store the keys in appsettings.json. And then it will work both on our local machine as well as on Azure or Smarter ASP. But keep in mind, this is not encrypted. So it's probably not the ultimately for a production app, not where we'd want to store those keys. I have described using the key vault, but in the Azure config site section, but we'll just skip over that. We then need to configure our app. We need to enable Google authentication. So this is kind of a three-step process. Step one is we'll need to install a package from the NuGet package manager, which is the Google authentication package for .NET Core. And then we're gonna add some code in our startup file that enables Google authentication. And it's going to read the client ID and client secret from our app settings file. We could hard code the API keys in our code, but that's not really best practice. Those values should be in a 
separate configuration file, so they're easy to change. And then once this is configured, both our register and login pages are then going to show a Google button here instead of this message saying there are no external services configured, we'll have a Google button that we can click instead. So that button will automatically appear. And then after a Google sign in, users are going to get a page that looks kind of like this one. And they get redirected back to our Global Grub site. They'll say, hey, you've successfully authenticated with Google. Please confirm your email to register. And then it will actually create the user in two different tables in our database. The first table is our ASP.NET users table. So that account will be in there with our admin and customer. But then it's also going to add them to this ASP.NET user logins. So it's going to take their user ID and the login provider. So we know this user is signing in through Google. Once you enable Facebook login in your lab, then you'll have users logged in through Facebook as well. Okay, so these slides are on Blackboard for you to reference. You can find them here under the lesson eight slides. So think what we'll do, 1147, let's just navigate off to the Google console to get started and then we'll maybe take a break. This is gonna take us a little while to work through the Google application setup process. So in your browser, you can simply go, I'll put the link in the chat, They've changed it a bit. You know, console.cloud.google.com. You will need to sign in with a Google account. It can be any account, doesn't matter. But it needs a valid Google login. So go here in your browser. And then I think we will take a pause here. And we will come back at 12 and we can start to set up the project with our OAuth client and our credentials. We'll work and set things up in the Google console first. Then we'll have to go add our credentials to our Visual Studio project and then enable all the code that we need to get this Google sign in working. Okay. Let's take a break here. I'm not going to pump, I haven't changed any code, so there's really nothing to go up on GitHub yet. We will come back at noon. Okay, I'm going to go step away, take a quick break, and we'll be back at 12.